right. Well, welcome everyone and welcome to Alta C Project Blue at Summer's live chat with Dr. Andrew Thurber. This is part of a series of live chats that Alta C has been putting on. Um, you can find all of the recorded ones and this one once we're done at altac-projects-blue.org. I'll put that link in the chat for everyone. Um, and again, happy 4th of July weekend. And we're very excited to have Dr. Andrew Thurber here with us. Um, he's currently the assistant professor in oceanography and microbiology at Oregon State University. His research focuses on understanding how the ocean works with particular emphasis on how the ocean systems function as a whole. He's been all over from Hawaii to Antarctica um, for his research. And today, he'll be talking about the fascinating landscape of Antarctica's methane seeps. So Dr. Thurber, thank you so much for joining us. And with that, take it away. Great, thank you very much for having me. I'm really happy to be here. And so just jump right into it. So today I'm gonna to talk to you about Antarctica. I'm gonna to talk to you about methane seeps and sort of in the reverse order of that. But I sort of thought I'd start by taking a step back and talking about sort of why I do what I do. And, and so uh, I study ecology, I study ocean ecosystems. And when I try to describe sort of what I do, the best way to do that is say, I like to ask questions of the ocean and I very rarely get the answer I'm expecting. And so that leads to a better understanding of what we know and more specifically what we don't, don't know. Now, a lot of this involves taking an ecosystem perspective. So thinking about chemistry, microbes and animals, and how they interact with each other. And that doesn't just advance our knowledge about those particular groups or the ocean, but we do it to better understand society and then and the interaction with the ocean and society or the earth and society, but also how we can try to manage those resources or the oceans for sustainability. That sustainability can be sustainability of functions of the ocean, a healthy ecosystem, or just an ecosystem that allows the persistence of life. Now, today I'm gonna to talk to you kind of about happenstance, lucky discoveries. And one of the things I love about my job is I can spend years writing proposals about exactly what I'm gonna find when I go out and do research. But usually we find out things that we didn't expect to find out and we didn't know. And I think a lot of this sort of comes down to this quote that I'll steal from the Lord of the Rings, which it describes a lot of research, which is it's dangerous business, Frodo, going out your door, you step out onto the road and if you don't keep your feet, there's no knowing where you might be swept off to. And that's really the story that I'm gonna to tell today through a scientific lens. So two habitats I find completely just intoxicating are methane seep habitats. And this is a frontier of understanding the boundary of the earth. How does it work? How does the atmosphere work? And how does the ocean fit into that function? The other side of my research that I also just love to study is Antarctica. It's a forefront of discovery also about how the earth works. And what was really surprising as I'll develop over today's talk is that they also interact where to understand our globe, we really need to understand methane seeps in Antarctica. And right now it's a giant hole in our knowledge of the earth system. But let's start out by talking about methane seeps because I think not everybody knows about methane seeps and I really uh, find them fascinating systems, especially when we try to understand the globe. So discovery in methane seeps actually starts with the discovery of hydrothermal vents. 1977 to 1979, the first hydrothermal vent was discovered. And when we think about things that were found out and discovered but not meant to be discovered, hydrothermal vents are a great example of that. Now there's an often told tale that scientists went out, they put a sub in the water and they stumbled across hydrothermal vents not expecting to find them there. That's a nice story, but it's not really true. What really happened was that a multi-institutional group of scientists led by Jack Corliss at Oregon State University went out with a submersible knowing they were gonna find hydrothermal vents. Every line of evidence suggested that it was gonna be there. In fact, we couldn't balance the heat budget of the planet without having submarine marine hydrothermal springs that were providing energy into the deep ocean. So they knew they were gonna find it. What they didn't know was that they were gonna find biology there. And here's some uh, images from the paper that describe the first discovery of hydrothermal vents showing this biological discovery, which not only changed our understanding of the ocean, but also really advanced our understanding of biology itself. 
Now this is a more up-to-date video. This was taken as part of the Interactive Oceans Program and also part of the Ocean Observatories Initiative of Axial Seamount, which is a hydrothermal vent that's right off our coast in the Pacific Northwest. We actually have a cabled array running out to it, which you might have heard about it uh, on a previous one of these discussions. But what it shows is that there's a mass of animal life. This animal life is not fueled from the sun. It is fueled by chemicals being released from the seed floor. And at hydrothermal vents, it's mixed with incredibly hot temperatures exceeding 100, 200, 3 degrees, 300 degrees Celsius. These are ecosystems in and unto their own, where you have these worms that you see in front of them. These are essentially grazing on bacteria. They're surrounded by massive amounts of biomass, of limpets, all of this is being fueled by chemical energy captured by bacteria and archaea, another domain of life, that's taking carbon dioxide and turning that into biomass that can fuel this entire ecosystem. We didn't expect it, and its discovery really led to an entire reappreciation for the role of symbiosis in biology writ large, but especially in these sort of what we thought then were unique and extreme habitats. Probably the most iconic discovery of those were these worms. Now this is Rigia Picea. It's a closely related species to those ones that were discovered in the late 1970s. But these are interesting because they have no mouth, they've got no anus, they've got a gut that's been modified into a biochemical reactor for microbes to harness hydrogen sulfide, mix it with oxygen, and create biomass that they can then fuel the worm. So that really changed our understanding, thinking about how the ocean functions. But at that time, it was sort of a one-off. Now, shortly thereafter, 1984, we discover these habitats called methane seeps. Now, methane seeps, this is imagery taken off the coast of Washington and Oregon, are again areas of incredibly high biomass. They're areas that we didn't know exist, and they're fueled by chemical energy released from the seafloor. The main form of energy that's released is methane. It's modified on its way up. And then it's harnessed by all of these different critters that use that ener chemical energy to exist in incredibly high abundances. Now, these are intriguing environments for so many reasons. I could talk about it for seven hours, and I'm not going to. But one of the things that's really interesting about them is they live a long time, and they're also driven by completely different geologic processes. Right now, you're seeing bubbles streaming out of the seafloor. Those are methane mixed with carbon dioxide. And again, incredibly high biomass on the seafloor, which are analogous to hydrothermal vents that were not discovered till a few years later. The other thing I want you to notice from this video, there's a lot of other stuff that's just normal fauna. There is a Dover sole, here's some black cod or sablefish, whatever you want to call them. There's octopods, there's crinoids or feather stars, there's anemones, there's a lot of other critters that are taking advantage of this habitat. And that's also shifting our understanding of the ocean ecosystem. So methane's an interesting gas. So first off, it is a potent greenhouse gas. Carbon dioxide is not a good gas, and the problem we have with carbon dioxide is we put so much into the atmosphere that we've greatly increased its effect at warming our atmosphere. Now, methane is 25 times as effective at carbon, as carbon dioxide at warming our atmosphere. In fact, it's one of the most important greenhouse gases on the planet. The other thing that's really interesting about it is there's vast stores in the ocean and it forms the right pressure and temperature, this weird ice. And you can think about it as one molecule of methane encapsulated in a cage of water that essentially keeps it locked in as a result of the cold temperature and high pressure in the deep ocean. Now these build up over time, and I'm talking about thousands and thousands of years, to vast stores in the ocean. And so our current estimates are somewhere on the order of 455 to 1800 gigatons of methane in the ocean, which is a massive reservoir of potential greenhouse gas. Now there's some good news that I'll tell you in a second, but there's also some concerning news. And sort of one of the most paradoxical things right now is it's rising in the atmosphere. If we look at this figure, and I don't have a whole lot of um, figures in here, this is a image from uh, Ruppel and Kessler. This is the concentration of methane in red and parts per billion in the atmosphere. And you can see that it wobbles up and down over time for many reasons that we know. And then at some point, it just has started to go up. It's about 150% has it's gone up since the pre-industrial age. And unlike carbon dioxide, which we know why it's gone up, methane, we don't know why it's gone up. 
there's some competing hypotheses, but the main thing is it's an unexplained increase in greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. Okay, so that's the sort of scary news. The good news is this, microbes. So how does the planet not have anything that leaps, leaks out of those? And I should say that methane seeps form where you have leaky hydrate reservoirs, leaky subsurface methane reservoirs. As that methane comes up, it is consumed by essentially two pretty distinct groups of microbes. And my favorite, and the first one I'll talk about all the, are these ANME aggregates. I consider these sort of the super M&Ms of the deep sea. And the reason is it's a syntrophic partnership. It's a symbiosis between an archaea, shown in this image that has the different bacterial and archaeal taxa labeled by color, where you have this candy coating of green archaea that capture methane, and then you have this chocolatey center of sulfate-reducing bacteria that capture sulfate. They literally trade electrons and they consume methane. Now, as a byproduct, they also produce sulfide, which can then be eaten by other things, but this process, by these taxa, and there's a few different lineage of them, consume 90% of the methane released from these massive seafloor reservoirs in the ocean. This group of taxa pretty much keeps our planet from having a runaway greenhouse effect from these massive methane reservoirs. Now, they're not the last line of defense. That's another good, good news. We also have the second group of taxa called aerobic methane oxidizing bacteria. Main difference here, these are just bacteria. They take oxygen and methane, they eat that methane, and they pretty much consume everything that escapes. So these two microbes actually consume almost all of the methane that's released from the ocean reservoirs, even though the processing of it also creates methane seeps. So methane seeps is the surface manifestation of methane being released from the subsurface, and it's mixed and modified by these microbes to essentially keep it out of the atmosphere. That's a good thing. So this, to the different environments that we uh, essentially have created are we have methane getting released from these vast reservoirs. It's eaten by these ANME aggregates. And then the sulfide that's produced comes up and it fuels all these different bacteria. And so what this image is, this is an image of what we call a bacterial mat. There's a couple different kinds of bacteria. Some are orange, some are white. Most of them are white because they've got sulfide actually in their filaments. And that's an area that other things can come in and graze. We have clams. These are very similar to the clams you find at hydrothermal vents. They also eat the sulfide. That's released as a byproduct of these microbes eating methane. And then we've got these pretty much uh, jack of all trades, these mussels. This is an image taken at 1,000 meters off Costa Rica. So 3,000 feet water depth. It looks like an intertidal zone from the Pacific Northwest coast, but all these mussels are eating sulfide. They'll eat methane directly. And then if there's neither, none of that present, they'll also just sort of get through the lean times by eating phytoplankton and at vents, they can even eat hydrogen. It's all of those are done through symbioses, but it's an incredible um, way to approach. Now, the other thing that I really like to point out in this figure is you see there's rocks everywhere. Those rocks, that's a further byproduct of this reaction they essentially shift the chemistry in sediment and they create rock. That rock further captures carbon dioxide, keeping it out of our atmosphere, another good thing, but also creates an entirely different habitat where you can see things like fish hiding in the nooks and crannies, little squat lobsters over here. And in, in other words, they're completely shifting the environment in the deep sea while consuming a greenhouse gas. As you can probably tell, I'm a fan of these methane munching microbes. We can further see how they're interacting with different deep sea critters that are not only known to occur at methane seeps. And I love this particular picture. First off, you can see this is a tube worm over on the right hand side that's out of its tube. This area over here is where the bacteria do that magical mixing of hydrogen sulfide and oxygen to create the, to capture the energy to fuel the worm. And this particular worm can be three meters in length or nine feet in length and live for more than 200 years. Now, the reason why I like this particular image is you can see a lot of critters that are not seep-specific critters. You can see these big anemones growing on them. This is a, one of my favorite deep sea animals, the sea pig, that's sort of roving around this deep sea methane seep, and starts to indicate that these seeps may actually start playing a greater role in the ocean ecosystem. Now, speaking of happenstance and discovery, uh, one of the things we've discovered 
is that these are far more abundant than we ever thought. And so 1984, this was the first methane seep discovered. Here's that uh, first hydrothermal vent that was discovered. A few years ago, I updated this. Now all the blue dots <clears throat> are, are methane seeps, the red dots are hydrothermal vents, and we're really finding them all over the ocean. Since then, technological advances have increased the rate of methane seep discovery exponentially. And I'll tell you just a little tale from my backyard, the Pacific Northwest, and show this particular map. So this is the Pacific Northwest. Here is Vancouver Island, uh, Washington, Oregon, Northern California is down here-ish. And essentially what you can see is each one of these red dots is an area of known methane seepage. We know about 10. Through some specific crews and especially led by colleagues at NOAA, uh, we've essentially increased that number from 10 to 2,500. And there's more that we just haven't found yet. That's not a story that's unique to the Pacific Northwest. A similar discovery has been made off of the East Coast of the US. A similar discovery has been made in New Zealand. There are thousands and thousands of methane seeps. And this particular point really starts to change how we view methane seeps, especially when you think about those previous slides that showed lots of different critters using, essentially uh, aggregating at methane seeps. And that's becoming more important if you don't have five or 10, but you have thousands wherever you look. Now, as part of looking at those habitats, at one point, the, an ROV driven by colleagues, or I should say, uh, employed by colleagues in Canada stumbled across this particular image. These are all tanner crabs. Uh, they're sometimes sold as the uh, deep sea snow crab or just snow crab, uh, and they're commercially harvested species. They stumbled across thousands of them at a methane seep once. And that too was completely unexpected. Now, my favorite part of the story is actually this next image video. Again, this is imagery taken by Oceans Network Canada through collaboration with them. But what it shows is these tanner crabs essentially grazing at a methane seep. These are methane bubbles coming out of the seafloor. And you can see they're rapidly just grazing away on the mud as they do until this particular one actually had that ice made by methane build up on its bottom, kind of like a balloon filling with hydrogen, taking off the seafloor and then dropping it on its head. What this shows is that organisms that are occurring at these methane seeps are also getting energy from the methane seeps. And this becomes much more important if you know of 2,500 instead of 10. And in fact, we've started to do some calculations that methane seeps, especially when combined with hydrothermal vents, although methane seeps do their high abundance providing more, provide about 10% of all of the energy that goes into the deep sea. And this is an example of how these critters are likely to end up on our dinner table at some point. Also point out, methane's not toxic. These would be totally fine to eat. It's not it's any sort of human health risk, but essentially expands how methane seeps may influence the ocean ecosystem and society's use of ocean ecosystems. So the discovery of methane seeps led to unexpected biology. We've seen a diversity of those habitats from methane seeps to, uh, sorry, from microbial mats to large rocky outcrops they're abundant. We now know of thousands wherever we look. They're essential fish habitats. We've made some starts towards showing that certain species, Dover sole, black cod, certain deep water species off New Zealand, all are found in increased abundance at methane seeps. And then we're increasingly appreciating that they fuel the oceans. And there's some potential that we can harvest methane from uh, the deep sea to actually fuel, be used as fuel by society, although that is a very contentious issue and currently the technology does not exist to do that. However, what I really like about it is that they're also really driven by these methane munching microbes that keep our planet inhabitable. So that was the good part of the story. Why do I not sleep at night, at least when it comes to my scientific um, research? So there's some budgets we know really well. There's some things that are you know, the scientific community has invested a lot of time and we've really narrowed it down. There's been a lot of effort invested into the methane budget, but even in the IPCC and the intergovernmental, the, the panels on climate change, the consensus is we've got a pretty good idea, but we're pretty sure we're just at a starting point about methane. In fact, it's an area that everybody feels is one of those cycles that we need to do more research on because while we know how much is in the atmosphere, 
the estimates of how much is in the ocean range greatly and are constantly being revised. And then the amount of methane released from the ocean is also an area that is constantly being revised. Methane is trapped in the, in the ocean in that ice form by cold temperatures of the ocean and we're warming the ocean. Uh, the image on the upper right hand side shows where we're warming the ocean and by the relative degrees. In some cases, we're seeing multi-degree temperature ranges predicted by the end of the year, sorry, the end of the century, but in the year 2100 when this map is formed. And even small changes can change the, essentially the amount of methane being released from them. A very contentious topic that currently, a very recent paper by uh, some colleagues at OSU say is probably not the case, but it's been debated for the last 20 years. There's a chance that massive release of methane had led to or contributed to, and that's what's contentious, the really uh, massive extinction events on our planet, including extent, extinction of 50% of species. So that's a bad thing, whether it's, uh, and it's still an active area of research to figure out to what extent that role happened. Uh, and then there's also some things that we really don't know about, and specifically some regions we really don't know about. So the methane cycle, not well constrained. Uh, it's changing. It may be really bad if it's released, in addition to just the fact it's an incredibly efficient greenhouse gas. And then also there's some areas we don't know. And that's where we get to start thinking about Antarctica. Now, when most people think about Antarctica, they think about penguins. I love penguins. I'm not going to fault anybody for thinking about penguins but it's also a great unknown when it comes to the methane cycle and also its general role in the Earth system because it's integral to the functioning of our Earth even though it's way down on the bottom. So why should we care about Antarctic methane? First off, nobody, pays, nobody knows much about it. Uh, the Antarctic continent is estimated to contain somewhere between four and 46% of the global marine methane stores. Um, that's a wide ranging number. I would say neither of those endpoints are correct, but the middle somewhere in there is correct. And it means there's massive amounts of methane stored in the Antarctic continent. However, we don't know who eats it. Are the methane munching microbes there? Are animals there? We don't know. The Antarctic is warming. Certain parts of it are warming as fast as anywhere else on the planet. Uh, and is it gonna start releasing its methane? And then even if it does release, start releasing methane, how quickly can these microbes respond to changing methane in this environment that we don't even know what microbes are there and responsible to it? Now to add to that sort of intrigue, one of these facets that's just fascinating about these anemones is that they are pretty much the bristle cone pine of the microbial world. Most microbes double on the order of, you know, once a day, slow one, once every couple of weeks. And that'd be a really slow one. These anaerobic methane oxidizing archaeal and bacterial aggregates, the cells double on the order of six to seven months. They do not grow fast. They likely live quite a long time, but they're not what you would want to have a necessary response to a changing greenhouse gas cycle because it may take a long time. So the other challenge we have with Antarctica is clearly we want to know more about it. This estimate of the amount of methane there was a single study that everybody says we need to do more studies on, uh, but we don't know. But what do we know about other reducing habitats, hydrothermal vents and methane seeps? Well, the first Antarctic vent that really got, uh, had unique fauna was discovered not that long ago. Uh, in, it was discovered in 2010. The paper came out a few years after that, and it was really interesting. And I'm actually just gonna jump to a video that was put on by, it, uh, essentially shows what they found there. Uh, this was led by Lee Marsh and John Cop Copley from um, Southampton University. They found these Antarctic polar yeti crabs. It's a third species of yeti crab. They're covered with bacteria. And they were found at uh, very deep depths in a clearly unique hydrothermal vent. Some of these bacteria growing on the yeti crabs are also the kind that can eat methane. And that's one of the insights we have into the Antarctic methane system. There's been two found. They were both found on the South Sandwich islands, I should say the South Sandwich Trench, which is um, in the Southern Ocean. And what we found is there's a lot of things to discover down there, which, explain, which is not surprising consider all of the different discoveries that occur in Antarctica. Things work differently in Antarctica. This is just a mass of Yeti crabs, and they again harvest bacteria to be able to survive in this, uh, this very warm environment.
Now, Antarctic methane seeps have been a more challenging story to tell. Now, the first Antarctic methane seep, uh, sort of of a traditional methane seep form, was found uh, and dis essentially discovered and published on in 2009. But the tale is a bit of a sad one because it was found underneath an ice shelf that calved. Researchers came in to see what was present, and they got images, very grainy images, of a methane seep habitat. They mounted an entire expedition. They came back, and at that point, that methane seep, for some unknown reason, had turned off. So they got some dead shells. They found one type of anemone that was present there in anemone 3. But really, it was not a seep that could be studied when active. It provided a little bit of insight, but not as much as we had hoped. Those pictures of clams, those are seep specific uh, clams, and vent specific clams that have symbionts that eat sulfide. So we knew it was a seep, but we don't know why. Coming up in later, um, this paper found in a great abundance of seeps in South Georgia Island. And they found many seeps, as you can see, from these bubble flares. And that's an area that we're starting to get much more inf information. But that's a far cry from the Antarctic continent, which is where those methane reserves are that, again, we know very, very little about what's going on. So Antarctica, I consider a frontier of knowledge. Uh, it's an area that we study to understand the entire planet. And it's an area I've been studying for a long time, uh, I guess uh, going on 19 years or something like that, maybe 20 now. Um, this is what most people think about when they see Antarctica, or they think about Antarctica. They either think about penguins or they think about ice. This is a frozen ocean with an active volcano in the foreground. Everything is white. It's actually quite beautiful. I wouldn't say it's hospitable, but it's a, it's a beautiful place to research. But one of the reasons I love it is if you look underwater, there's a massive animal life. There's sponges that are huge here. You can see this is a, a, a diver, a normal sized diver next to this giant sponge. And you can also just look around and see a mass of animal life everywhere you look. The marine environment, unlike above ground, is covered with biology. It has diversity. It's completely, almost entirely dominated by invertebrates and microbes, both of which I find intoxicating reasons to study. And yet there's five months of darkness, five months of light, a month of sunrise, and a month of sunset. Really cool place to study. There's tons of different organisms there, cnidarians, sea urchins, scallops, sponges, uh, brittle stars, anemones, tube worms, giant sea spiders, and I love them because they can't actually bite you and kill you even though they're the size of dinner plates, worms that are six to seven feet long or two meters long that are essentially swimming slimy intestines, crinoids or feather stars and sponges, it's essentially just a mass of animal life. Now, one of the reasons I love working at McMurdo, which is where this is, it's as far south as you can go and not actually be physically underneath a multi-hundred uh, foot thick ice sheet, is it's an area that research has been going on since the early 1900s during the great age of exploration of Antarctica. And there's been dive, people diving since 1963-ish in the McMurdo region, in fact, at the sites that we still dive today. This is some imagery of it. I should say the water is cold at minus two degree, minus 1.8 degrees C, 28 degrees Fahrenheit. These brave souls were wearing wetsuits with very old regulator technology and essentially doing landmark research there. I came along in the age of dry suits. It's actually no, nowhere near as extreme as it may look. And the reason why I put this slide up is I was down there for a completely different research project. And my, master, my that master's advisor, I was then a, a postdoc at the time, was still doing research down there. And she came over to my, my lab when I was studying worms and was like, hey, you should go look at this area, cinder cones. We've been diving there forever. And all of a sudden, there's this waterfall of bacteria, probably something you'd find pretty interesting. So I sort of begrudgingly slipped away from my microscope where I was looking at worms, and I went and dove the site. This is one of those stories of happenstance where by being there and being lucky, we were able to make a discovery that's been incredibly informative that I think is going to help inform us about the Earth system. So this is what she was talking about. This is the cinder codes net, what we now call methane seep. It's shallow. It's only 10 meters or 30 feet deep. And it's this expansive microbial mat. And the minute I jumped in the water, I said, well, this is a big methane seep. It took me a while to actually show that. But this provides the opportunity to actually study the Antarctic 
methane seat system in a way that we've never been able to, and it's shallow. So rather than having to bring a submersible down, we can simply dive through the ice, get down, and sample a methane-fueled community. Now this is what the environment normally looks like. This is an area that's been dove on since the 1980s, if not before. Uh, and this seep was not there before. Uh, Dr. Stacy Kim, who was the one who told me about it, essentially been diving on it every year off and on since uh, for decades. And she was the one that said all of a sudden it showed up. So that also provides a really exciting opportunity that we know when this methane seep formed. So the opportunities that this provides are, are completely unique because we know exactly when it formed so we can see how quickly those essentially bristlecone pine critters took to get, become established. And it's an active methane seep in Antarctica that we can study. And so we sampled it in 2012 and 2016 to essentially see how the community evolved. What do we expect? Well, we expected to see the things that we know should be there. We expected to see these mighty M&Ms of methane munching microbes. In fact, we expected to see ME2s because the chemistry is right for it. And we expected to see ME3s, a different group that are the ones that were found on the Antarctic Peninsula and are also found in the Arctic. As usual, we were completely wrong. And let me walk through what we did find. First off, we sampled it through a couple of years. In the first year, it was a 70 meter long feature that was one meter wide. There were no animals in the sediment. That's unique. Sulfide is toxic to a lot of critters. You need to have specific ones that can survive there. There was a weird single-celled protist that was going around, around eating all the um, chemoautotrophic microbes. Methane was present, and it was highly sulfitic. The microbial results were completely perplexing, though. We found those aerobic microbes, the ones that are the last line of defense, but we didn't find any anaerobic methane oxidizing archaea, these anemies, which normally are 90%, eat 90% of the methane before it can come out. We revisited it in 2016. Well, actually, we got images from it in 2014. It was still there. And then in 2016, it had shrunk a little bit. There had been one worm that showed up. And then the, the pattern of the microbes that were there were completely befuddling. Anime ones, which are not supposed to like cold temperature, again, it's minus 2C, do not like high sulfate. There was high sulfate. We're there. So that didn't make any sense. And me too, the ones that were potentially the right ones were very rare. At least they were the right kinds that we'd expect there. And then the taxa that are adapted or we think are adapted to cold temperatures were not there at all, at least with exhaustive uh, molecular approaches. So that was really surprising based on what we know about the planet elsewhere. The other thing we stumbled upon is if we just swam up to seven meters depth, or 21 feet, we found a new seep that had formed in that duration between 2012 to 2016. Now this one was more than 25 meters off in the distance. I will tell you, we're diving through an ice hole and we only swim so far away from the ice hole. And we essentially swam as far as we were willing to swim from the ice hole. And then we said, the seep goes off in the distance. So that's why it's greater than 25 meters depth. As, as always, the number one rule of research is make sure you return from research. So we turned back to that dive hole and continued our science. So this image shows these little, um, little flux chambers where we can measure how much methane is being released from the seafloor over a given period of time. These were designed uh, by my grad student, Dr. S or who is now a postdoc in uh, New Zealand, Dr. Sarah Seabrook. And they're nice because you can put a bunch of them out and then measure how much methane is being released over time. What we found is that methane was being released continually from these little areas of seepage across the entire feature on the order of about two millimoles methane per meter squared per day, which is what a normal methane seep releases. However, it was still releasing it. And we'd expected after all this time, after five years of this methane being released, the microbes would have responded. Instead, what we found is that the microbe methane filter had not yet started to actually completely consume the methane being released, which was a significant finding. So in many cases, we found more paradoxical results than we found what we were expecting. We didn't find the type of critter we were expecting, the type of microbe. We didn't find any of the taxa that are known to exist in methane seeps other than the microbes. And those even took five to years to start to become established, and they were the wrong ones. And that filter is taking a long time to form. So how this has informed our overall understanding of this methane cycle is first off, 
things don't respond quick. We're warming the oceans, we're shifting these processes. All the models suggest that we're going to increase the amount of methane being put in the ocean. We now know it takes at least years, if not maybe even decades, to have the microbes adapt to the point where they can consume that methane. Currently, no critters have appeared that we expected to see there, although hopefully at some point we'll get back to see if it's just taken five to 10 years to get there. And throughout all of this time, methane's being released into the water column. We don't know if it's making it into the atmosphere, but what we do know is that climate models that do incorporate methane being released as a result of changing reservoirs include them as CO2, just assuming these microbes are gonna eat all the methane. We're not so sure that assumption is correct without some sort of time lag. And so hopefully this will, can help inform future, cl future climate models. I'll tell you, there's some things we still don't know. We don't know why it turned on in 2011. It's still a great mystery. And we also don't know wh whether there was this group of anime there that was essential, why the group of anime was there that was there and whether there might be some other taxa that's eating methane there that we don't even know because it's not present in the other regions of the planet that we study. So I'm pretty much done. I've gone over time. I apologize about that. I'd like to end with this slide because what I hope uh, I've uh, convinced you a little bit about uh, is showing why this political cartoon from the New York from 1980 is uh, maybe not totally correct. It's the people sitting around having some tea and saying, I don't know why, I don't care about the bottom of the ocean, but I don't. And I hope what I've been able to convey to you is that there's reasons that we do need to know what's going on at the bottom of the ocean, but also reasons why it's really important to continue trying to understand what's going on at the bottom of the world in Antarctica and combining those two to better inform our understanding of the Earth system. So with that, uh, here's a quick summary. Uh, I don't need to read it. I wanna thank uh, two graduate students that helped me on this project. They've both now moved on to different things. Uh, Dr. Sarah Seabrook and Dr. Rory Welsh. Sarah is now a deep sea ecologist in New Zealand and Rory is actually fighting disease at the Center of Disease Control in, Washington, in uh, Atlanta, trying to uh, keep America healthy. Funding was provided by the National Science Foundation as well as NOAA Ocean Exploration and Research, which essentially means this is taxpayer funded research. So I'd like to thank you for supporting this research. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Awesome, well, thank you so much, Dr. Derby. This was awesome. Um, and well, I guess we'll get right into it. We got some questions to ask. Um, Ryan uh, asks about, um, are there any plans to study Oh, just went away. Are there any plans to study the same methane seeps in 2010, 20 or in the near future? And do you have uh, any anticipations for how they've evolved since 2016? So that's a great question. We don't have funding right now uh, to go down and continue to research. We've actually sort of paused on seeking funding because we think it's going to take 10 years for these seeps to be fully uh, developed. And so we're going to start putting in proposals to get down there to see what's happened in the time since 2016. So I think in, uh, hopefully we'll get down there in the next few years to actually discover them uh, or to see how the microbial community has changed and see, and I really hope from you know, the fate of the Earth's uh, side of things that they've become so well established that they are then actually consuming the methane and keeping it out. And I have to say my like dream of dreams would be get down there and there's giant tube worms and stuff growing out of them, but uh, we all need to want things, but we don't know what we find if we went down. So I had a question about the tube worms and those kind of things. So you said that they're not, you didn't expect to find any animals you found down there. Are they, are you, are you finding the same animals at each methane seep or are they all different, um, different animals at different locations? If that so makes that, sense. Yeah, that totally makes sense. So uh, we are trying to expand our understanding of what species are found at different locations. And one of the things that discovering 2,500 new seeps has provided as it allows us to look at how different seeps are. And so we have a general idea of what type of critters we should find at a given methane seep. But I'll have to tell you, when we started diving below 1,000 meters off the coast of Oregon and Washington, we started finding those tube worms. And we hadn't known of any tube worms. There was a couple in Monterey and maybe a little, little bush off British Columbia. But now, most of the times we dive below 1,000 meters, we discover an environment that we didn't, a group of species that we didn't know was present off our coast. We don't know why we don't find them at 600 meters off our coast. There's plenty of good habitat they should live in, and yet they don't. So we have general ideas what we should find. We don't always know what species we'll find. 
but also I'll say that anytime we go down there, we often find things that we were not expecting and that can help expand our understanding of global biodiversity and things like that. Antarctic methane seeps, I think if we found a good active deep sea methane seep, um, who knows what we would find there. It'd be really exciting. Yeah, that sounds, that's, that's interesting. Um, so then we have a question from Ken. And Ken asked, do we know where the most methane comes out of the ocean to atmosphere? And is there any technology to capture it and either sequester it or use it for, um, for example, natural, nat natural gas turning, to, turning it into carbon or plastics? So uh, we have areas that we know more methane comes out than others. And sort of the, the, more, the greater direction that I think in general science is going is being concerned about shallower areas. And one of the reasons there again is physics is on our side. Something that's released from a bubble that's released from a thousand meters, which will go straight up to the surface. As it actually goes up, the methane inside that bubble is sucked outside of that bubble just simply because of the gas differential. And it replaces the methane in the bubble with carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide is getting out of the atmosphere, but it's not methane and that's a better thing. However, as you go shallower and shallower and shallower, there's less time for that to happen and there's a greater chance of methane to come out. I'd say if you wanna know where the you know, forefront of research is, is if you start going north and you go to these vast shallow areas where you have uh, permafrost and shallow regions, and in fact, that's one of the areas that doubled the global estimate of how much methane was coming out of the atmosphere. Shallow areas, you don't have a deep water column that can suck the methane out of the water column. Uh, out of the bubble. In addition, you don't have as much time for the microbes to eat that methane before it can become in contact with the atmosphere because when it comes in contact with the atmosphere, it'll then get released. Uh, as to whether or not you can turn it into plastics or capture it, I think that's a future thing that we should uh, be thinking about. Right now, one of the challenges is that we, uh, there's a lot of different aspects of the methane uh, story, especially the biggest ways to make impacts on methane are places that are somewhat easier to constrain. Uh, wetlands, rice paddies, agricultural use, cows, things like that. So uh, the idea of capturing methane is a great idea uh, and it can be deployed in other terrestrial lands that we know are incredibly important emission sources of, of methane uh, prior to being uh, applied in marine environments. Gotcha. All right, um, Nancy has a question and she asks, with respect to the regular organisms that also use methane seeps, can stable isotope analysis be used to determine the proportion of their diet they get from methane fueled food chains versus regular food chains? Uh, so that was a very informed question, Nancy, <laughs> and hi. Uh, <laughs> so one of the things we can use to look at methane getting into food webs is this really great tool that methane that comes out of the seafloor has a very skewed ratio of carbon-13 to carbon-12. In general, there's about 1% carbon-13 of carbon-12 in the atmosphere, and yet enzymes can be very selective for one versus the other. And in fact, the microbes that make methane, and that's an entirely different side of the story, preferentially use carbon-12. And so you get this very skewed ratio of of methane that comes out. And anything that eats that methane incorporates that weird ratio. So traditionally what we've done is we've essentially looked for the amount of methane coming into a food web by looking at the amount of carbon-12 in their tissues versus the amount of carbon-13. Because phytoplankton, anything that falls down from the sea surface, it has a totally different ratio and it's pretty easy to tease apart. Although there's some squishiness in the numbers as to get an actual percentage. So that is a tool that is very effective if something is eating a lot of methane. On the other hand, if something like those tanner crabs are only wandering into the seeps periodically or only episodically on it, it's like if you ate, um, you go out to eat once a month, the majority of your tissue is, or the majority of your energy is not gonna come from that one meal. And the same thing is a problem if you have something that just periodically goes into a methane seep. It'll pick up some of that signature, but often it can lose sort of episodic use of that. Now, where that may be really important is with those tanner crabs or a sable fish or a dover sole or some uh, thorny heads or these other fish that we know use uh, methane seeps and uh, crabs. 
if they only go there and eat a little bit in winter when the times are lean and then they walk away and then eat the, the plenty of phytoplankton falling down from the surface, that ratio can essentially greatly underestimate the amount of food that they're getting from the methane seep because it may be a critical amount of food, but one that's missed with that technique. And so returning to more molecular techniques and sort of high resolution things, but those techniques have shown in other systems that there's a variety of different animals that do use methane seeps to be able to capture energy and at least use it periodically within their life cycle. Okay, um, Kiefer asks, um, because you were talking about the crabs earlier and how they were the same that you might find in commercial selling, um, is seafood in danger by this? And what area places to get seafood would it be the worst at? So um, first of all, I'll say no, sea seafood is not in danger from this at all. Methane seeps are not a toxic environment for us. This is a zero concern of where you should get your seafood from. Uh, in fact, these methane seeps are probably helping to support fish stocks to make these fisheries more sustainable rather than less sustainable where they exist. So uh, as a consumer and as an informed scientist, I would say you should have zero concern about getting uh, getting food that so at one point in its life actually got energy from a methane seep. Um, and the more importantly, what we need to do as a scientific community is get a better understanding of what fish stocks are actually benefiting from methane seeps so we can make sure they're just included in management decisions so we have healthy fish stocks and healthy fisheries going forward into the future. Right on. So, so seafood is still safe. That's good. That's good news. Seafood is safe. And, and I'll also say that it's, it's these, one of the things I found exciting is, you know, a lot of the fish actually come from the same water depths that we get methane, that we sample methane seeps. Mm -hmm. So uh, these, are, these are not just sort of like super weird things that are down way deep in the deep sea, but fishing is actively fishing at depths where deep or methane seeps are. So there's likely much more of a, an interaction that we don't know about and we're increasing our understanding of. So so you mentioned that that's it's um, we're we're fishing at that level. So methane seeps don't have to be just really deep in the ocean. They can be. Uh, what's what's the shallowest we found them? Uh, so you can find them in certain areas in the intertidal zone. So out on the shore, uh, and they go down. We found them in trenches to six thousand meters. So all ocean depths. We find there's a sweet spot for them at about six hundred meters or eighteen hundred feet. About and that's about where that the upper edge of hydrates sit. And so anything shallower than that, there's no hydrates. And so the hydrates don't keep the methane trapped. And so we see this sort of sweet spot between, I don't know, six, 500 and 700 meters <clears throat> water depth. But then we found them at 2000 meters, 6,000 meters, you know, sort of all over the place and definitely way up shallow. Wow, that's crazy. I, I, would, I, would, have, I would have figured they were much deeper than that. Um, that's, that's fun. Um, so you've, you've traveled from Hawaii to Antarctica. That's pretty two different separate climates. Um, this is kind of just a random question, but what's, the, what's your favorite place that you've done research at and why? So the, oh, that's, they're all so good. Uh, <laughs> so I, I love working in Antarctica and specifically at McMurdo Station. And the, and the reason why it is, is it's sort of Disneyland for scientists where you get to eat, sleep, science. Like you wake up, you science, somebody makes you food, uh, you do science, and then you do some more science, and you can get out and you can really focus. And yet there's also a huge infrastructure there of people to support the research enterprise. And that makes it incredibly efficient for scientists to actually make significant progress in a short period of time, in addition to the ability to dive there and manipulate research research is uh, remarkable. The people that you meet there, the people that support the research there are just amazing to talk to, different walks of life. Uh, and so it's also just this weird sort of microcosm of people that it's wonderful to, to interact with as well. So that's one of my favorite places. Um, every time I go in the deep sea, whether it's remotely sticking instrument there or uh, going down in a submersible, is also just a very special experience because you get to experience part of the planet that nobody else has seen. And so those are sort of weird juxtapositions. I love Antarctica because you can get so much research done. Uh, and also 
it has the unique opportunity of in general, when you're looking at animals there, you know what they are. So they've been studied since, you know, for over a hundred years, they have species names. That's a great thing. You go in the deep sea, pretty much there's a lot of the stuff that you find is new and it just becomes a challenge of trying to identify what you're looking at rather than answer the ecosystem questions. And so those are both awesome. It's great to find new species, but at the same time, it's also to have part of your life where you at least can put a name on that sea urchin you just picked up. That's awesome. It, now, now you, you said that Antarctica, the water there is pretty, pretty darn cold. Um, uh, do people, this might be a rookie question, but do, do people stay there year round researching or is it, is it, uh, is it on a, like, I think I read that you were there for seven months. Um, is it like on that kind of period of time? So there's, uh, yeah, so it's not a naive question or an unknown question. So it, uh, people are at the station all year. The vast majority of science occurs in a, about a seven month window. I've never been down for more than I think three months at a time. Uh, but pretty much for the Antarctic window, it shuts down to uh, keeping the station heated, running, getting it ready for the science season because the, the reason why that station is there is supportive science. And uh, there are science projects that go up, they release uh, meteor, uh, meteor meteorological weather balloons. They keep infrastructure running that allows uh, data to be coming off. And so there's a lot of projects like that. However, during what we call main body, which is when all the scientists go down in general, uh, it really goes from a station of a couple hundred people to over a thousand people. So it's like this weird little frontier down, town down there. That's when the diving occurs, most of the diving occurs, a lot of the glaciology occurs. Uh, there's also people at South Pole. That's a very small community during the winter. There's also people at a variety of different research bases supported both by the US as well as other countries. And they go down to, you know, 10, 16 people for the entire uh, winter. Diving in general shuts down at McMurdo. There have been diving projects that have gone on over winter in McMurdo. Uh, the ice conditions become more challenging at that uh, particular time. Uh, however, as you go farther north, there have been more winter long uh, projects that have included people diving throughout the winter because uh, the ice is a different is a different beast. So it, it comes and goes as you're on the peninsula rather than being essentially socked in from uh, the vast majority of the year in McMurdo. Interesting, that's cool. Um, all right, we got another question just came in from Ryan. Um, he asks, you mentioned that grad students that helped you out. Um, how do you generally organize your research projects with grad students or colleagues? Oh, that is a... I, I, it's a challenging one. So, um, you know, one of my jobs is to train the next generation of scientists. And so I put a lot of emphasis into trying to get grad students in the field and to experience the environments that they're studying. And, um, you know, it's the first step of the scientific method is to observe. And I think that getting people in the environment to actually observe it is critical to having leaders who can then form questions about the earth moving forward. And you don't get that same experience if you're not there. So I try to have a field fo forward lab where students get into the field, they get to experience the environment, and they get to essentially learn how to shape the future of research. Interacting with colleagues is totally dependent on the colleague. Uh, some are super easy to, get, to interact with and advance research, and just like any other personal interaction in any sort of work environment, it's completely different for different people. Some people uh, can, you can essentially periodically overlap with every once in a while and both do great synerg and do synergistic projects. Others you need to interact with on a much more common basis. So uh, there is no good answer to that. I will say one of the great things about a lot of the work that I've talked about is there is no better place to actually create cross interdisciplinary research than to show, throw people in a small place for a long period of time together. And so, for example, going to sea with a geophysicist, with a marine chemist, and myself, that's how science is advanced, because you have people that you're having dinners, dinners with, breakfast, lunch, lunches with, uh, and actually discussing your science and seeing how there's overlaps. And normally, even if that person is sitting in an office next door to me, I don't have the same interactions. And that's how you really make new discoveries and research. That happens in Antarctica, that happens on the ships, 
and that happens in field programs. And that's one of the reasons why marine science is especially an exciting avenue because you have that ability to cross disciplines naturally, um, even though those interactions completely vary with personalities, which is also, you know, that's a social studies aspect. And um, that's not my area of expertise, but you probably make a great reality TV show. <laughs> um, so, so kind of along those lines, how, if, if one would be interested in these, in, the, in studying methane seeps, how, or learning more about your work, what would you recommend their steps be to, from internships, volunteer programs? Uh, so internships and volunteer programs, and it's never too early to get involved and reach out to scientists that you like their work and see if they have an opportunity to work in their lab. Uh, we have opportunities at every career stage beyond. Um, it's very difficult for us to work with people who are under 18, although that's a possibility. Uh, but especially early in college careers, there's many different mechanisms to get involved in research. And I'd say pursue them. I'll also say that, you know, I never expected to be able to have any of the experiences that I get to do as my job. You know, the idea of going in a submersible was never something I thought I was going to be able to do. Um, but much like I started with, the, you know, when you leave your front door, you never know where your feet are going to land. The most important part is actually just leaving your front door and not being afraid of, one, getting told no, and two, you'll find somebody who provides that next path or provides you the ability to seek that next path to give the experiences that uh, will help take you down the road of discovering methane seeps or Antarctic research. Um, and I have to say that what I found most enjoyable in my career is I never thought I'd study methane seeps nor really the Antarctic or any of these other things. And that's where the, the path has taken me. Um, so don't be afraid to seek your dreams. And you know, when that new path shows up, don't be afraid to take it as well as pursue those through contacting scientists, uh, reading about these environments and, and observing the world around you. I think that's the only way that science can really go forward. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I think that about wraps it up. We're running out of time here. So I just want to thank you again. Um, it's been awesome. We had a lot of questions come in and uh, yeah, everyone, everyone learned a lot today. And um, if you want to find this later, we'll have a recording up shortly at altacy-project-blue.org. Um, and you can find us on all our social channels at Altacy. Um, and again, thank you so much, Dr. Andrew Thurber. Um, it's been a pleasure. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity. And thank you, everybody, for uh, listening in. And uh, have a great July 4th weekend. Yeah. Happy 4th of July, everyone.